name is, is Pastor Kevin Ivanko. Hallelujah, and, and I'm grateful to be here today. Uh, our pastor, Pastor G, is uh, blessing the community and blessing the city by uh, strengthening uh, area church and speaking a word of encouragement and a word of love to them today. But God is not uh, powerless to work how he wants to work, wherever he wants to work. So today, uh, as I've prayed and as I've laid myself before him, I've given myself to him today so that uh, his word might go forth, a message might go forth on behalf of all of us. Why don't we stand for a quick word of prayer? That's all right. He's all right. Lord, it is you and you alone who can enter our situations and restore us and refresh us and resurrect us, Lord, even as you have your son. Today, O oh Lord, I pray that you would put upon my lips your word and your message, that I may not add anything to it, that I may not take away anything from it, but that your perfect will would be done. I pray for your people, O oh God. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying today and give us a heart and a mind to receive, Lord, your love and your discipline. For Lord, we need a word. We need a word. So Lord, you bring it. For Lord, hallelujah, not one jot, not one tittle of your word shall vanish. This earth shall pass before your word. So Lord, come. Let your word come forward today and let it carry out all the purposes you have planned for it. For Lord, in your word, you declared that your word will not come back void. But Lord, it will be careful, hallelujah, to accomplish all that you have set it forth to do. So Lord, we are surrendered in your presence. We are attentive to your word and to your spirit. And Father, hallelujah, we give you free reign in here today. Free reign to do all that you want to do today. Hallelujah. In whatever way you need to come, in whatever way you need to touch, in whatever way you need us to bow, today, oh God, hallelujah, let thy will be done. Hallelujah in me. Hallelujah in your children, God, let it be done. Oh, to your glory, God, to your glory and not our own. We love you and we praise you. We are your children and we are grateful that you are our Father. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, go forth. Amen. 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 Well, I don't... I'm not up here too often. I want to thank, I thank God for who he is and what he's doing in the lives of his people. But I also want to thank some other people who are very dear to me very briefly. My family sitting in my front row, my beautiful wife and three of my daughters. I'll ask them to stand and maybe blush a little bit. My beautiful wife, Malika. My daughters, Kyla, Siobhan, Kalia. God ministers to me through them. And I thank God that he allows me to minister to them through his spirit. Today is a word about love and a word about discipline. So it's kind of a bittersweet word. And to tell the truth, most things are. So today as we prepare our hearts in worship, now we'll prepare it through his word. The title of today's sermon is Reluctant Perseverance. It's not about you, or is it? Hallelujah. So often we want something plain and simple and clean and, 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 and something that doesn't force us to go deeper, but that's not the way it's going to be today. Hallelujah, because his word is like a double-edged sword cutting on, even unto the marrow. 
which means that it gets to the very source of your life. Hallelujah. So today we want to look at a couple of scriptures. Actually, the scriptures will come up on the screen for us. But I want you to prepare your hearts, and if you have your Bibles with you, you're going to turn to Jonah today. And you can leave your book open to Jonah for the remainder of the service. It's not that we're going to be reading it verse by verse, but we will be looking at it. And Jonah is a short book. He's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament who spoke a word. But it's interesting that in the Old Testament, a lot of times the prophets actually, the, the, the books of the prophets are not about the prophets themselves. It's about the words that they're speaking. In the case of Jonah, it's very much about the prophet himself. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6 reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understandings. But in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. This is the main text for today. That if we would acknowledge him, if we would trust him, he would make our paths straight. That's not the story with Jonah. Jonah does something very different. However, we'll see that Jonah is still used of God. God's mission will go forward as it needs to, despite his reluctant perseverance. And one of the things about being, and we can substitute the word perseverance with obedience today. All right? Is that all right with you all? All right? To persevere means to continue on despite their circumstances. To, to hold true and to hold fast, to be steadfast in a course of action, in a cause, in a calling. Reluctance is quite the opposite. Reluctance means that there is an avoidance, an aversion. There is something that you don't want to do. As a matter of fact, it could be best described as an unwillingness. So how do we, how do we rectify these two words, reluctance, and perseverance. Well, if you know anything about uh, speech and literature, this is an oxymoron. An oxymoron is when you take two words which are distinctly opposite or opposed and you match them up together. Okay? It doesn't mean it's moronic, but it is an oxymoron like jumbo shrimp, right? Or even more so, a deafening silence. Two words that don't seem to go together, but yet when they're put together, their meaning becomes clear. A deafening silence makes no sense until that silence is so complete and so awesome that it becomes crushing in a deafening way. But when, we don't, when we're not obedient to God from the get-go, God still does his work. The problem is... It doesn't happen quite in the manner in which he had planned it to happen because God loves us enough that he gives us free will. He doesn't force our hand. He doesn't make us do anything. Everything he does is by invitation. He can command you to go. He can send you. He can give you a word. But you have the opportunity and you have the right and the privilege to deny that. You have the right and the privilege to run from it. The problem with this is when we are reluctant to persevere in the things of God, it comes with a cost. It comes with a cost not only to ourselves, but to those around us. And our reluctance may not disqualify us, but it will cause harm. It will cause you to learn a lesson. The second scripture today that I want us to look at comes out of Hebrews. And as pastor has been preaching about perseverance, he's been speaking about Hebrews and talking about how it is that if we persevere, then then we will get that which God has promised us, even though the saints of old in the Old Testament did not get the promise. In the 12th chapter of Hebrews, it reads, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves 
and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship and discipline. Verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who are trained by it. For those of you who are in Bible study, this sounds a little familiar. We covered a little bit of this territory earlier this week because the Lord was already laying this word upon my heart. And he wants everyone to hear a word coming from this. Have you ever seen a movie where, like, the opening scene starts off and you're, like, really confused by it? And it's not until the end of the movie that you realize that the opening scene was, like, the ending scene? Okay, somebody has seen Inception, right? Somebody has seen The Usual Suspects, okay? The movie starts out and the dramatic scene is going forward, and you don't know what it is. And then all of a sudden, poof, you're into a different scene, a different time. The person who you saw in the first scene looks a little different in the next scene. That's how we're going to go at it today in using the story of Jonah. Jonah is going to be not our main scripture and, and, and text for today, but it's going to be the story which we're going to look at. Okay? So it's the vehicle through which we're going to understand this lesson about trusting God and this lesson about uh, persevering even in our reluctance because he is a perfect example of a reluctant perseverer. He was anything but steadfast. He was not consistent in what he was doing. He was thrown to and fro as a man, as Scripture says, that do not be double-minded. Otherwise, we'll be thrown back and forth by the waves of life. But we want to look at Jonah in this sense. We want to look at Jonah as representing something more than just Jonah. Jonah needs to represent a couple of things in this scripture as we go through this sermon today. One, he's representative of Israel at the time. And I'll set a kind of background and historical perspective for you to understand that. But Jonah represents the church here today, a reluctant church. And as always, as you hear the word of God, you should take it personally. Jonah represents you. Jonah represents me today. For there is no one who is not reluctant to God's call and to God's bidding and to his will and to his word. So as we go through the story today, think of yourself as Jonah. Think of we as Christians today in society as uh, uh, Jonah, the church as Jonah. And as I put it in context, you'll see that he kind of personifies Israel at the time. And Nineveh, that great city of 120,000, which doesn't sound like much nowadays, but 120,000 in the 8th century BC is an awful lot of people. Nineveh represents the world. Those who are unsaved, those who don't know the Lord, but also the world as we see it, full of the greed and the indecency, the avarice, the indulgence. Okay? So as we go into the text today, that is what I want you to see. Opening scene. The prophet is sitting, he's kind of wind blown and torn. He's sitting down in a pile of sand, and he cries out to the Lord, Lord, it would be better if you just killed me. The sun is beating down on him. There's no shade. The wind is blowing. Sand is blowing in his face. He is tired. He is worn. He is angry, and he's defeated. The scene quickly fades. The next scene we see, we see Jonah yet again, but this time Jonah is in the courts of the king. Jonah has upon him a very nice robe. There is food about him. There is wine about him. There are women around. It's a festive time. 
The rooms are decked with cedar paneling. The walls are beautiful. There's no wind. There's no sun. Everything about the scene is pleasant. Everything about the scene is comforting. Everything about this scene speaks to living the high life. Things are good. This is the time of the prophets. This is a time where Israel is divided with Judah. But it is a time of peace, and it is a time of prosperity. It is a time of power, but it is also a time of poverty. In the days of Jonah, Jonah was a prophet who in the late or very early 8th century, spoke unto Israel and said, the Lord is going to restore us to the glory that it want, we once had under Solomon. And it came to be. He said there will be prosperity and peace in the land. And it came to pass. Jonah was a prophet of prosperity. Now, everybody likes to hear that. Now, that's not typical of most prophets. A lot of times the prophets have to speak some very harsh words, some very condemning words, some very challenging words unto the king and unto the people. But this was not Jonah's lot in life. Jonah got to usher in through prophecy an unprecedented prosperity and peace. For a hundred years, Israel had been fighting their neighbors to the north in Damascus, the Syrians, and the Syrians were taking land and, in fact, did take land and took cattle and took what they wanted. But in this time period, Jonah is seen as the prophet, the prophet who has brought the good news and prosperity. Now, he has some contemporaries, Amos and Hosea, and they were prophets as well, but they lived in the countryside. And in the countryside, it was a much different story. In the palace, things are good. In the cities, things are good. For those who have, things are good. The problem is they've gotten so much better for those who have because they've taken from those who have not. Not unlike this world that we live in, those who have, have more. Those who have not, have less. Those who were rich landowners understood that they could lend money to those who didn't have much. For those who didn't have much, it was just one bad crop away from losing your land because the bank, or in this case, the, the bigger landlords and those who had money uh, and loaned you money would take your land, and that's why they became so prosperous. Jonah... lived in the palaces. He lived with the elite. He was living the good life. So the word of God comes to Jonah. If you go to Jonah, if you haven't already in your Bible, please do so. The word comes to Jonah. And we don't really know what it is exactly that Jonah is supposed to say because God doesn't make it really clear in the, first, in the beginning of, of, of the chapter. But Jonah... One and one says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. So you would think the prophet would take the word and instantly go and do what it is the Lord has told him to do, because that's the prophet's job, to declare what thus saith the Lord, right? This is his job. This is his profession. This is his duty. Yet and still, we see a very different response from Jonah. If you know the story, it makes a lot of sense. If you don't know the story, well, let's go there. Jonah chooses not to do what it is the Lord has commanded him to do. He is reluctant. He is unwilling which begs the question, why is he reluctant? And again, if we are Jonah, if the church is Jonah, if 
if we as individuals are joining, why are we reluctant to do what it is the Lord has commanded us to do? The base of it, the reality of it is, Jonah's fearful. Jonah is fearful, but what is he fearful of? Is he fearful of the same things we're fearful of? He's fearful because you know what? To speak against Nineveh is to speak against the king of Assyria. Assyria is actually a kingdom a little bit further to the east of Israel. And they're the big enemy. Fortunately, right now, Syria is in Assyria is having their own problems within their own kingdom, so they're not fighting Israel. And Syria, who was the recent, most recent enemy and the most close enemy to Israel, has been defeated by the Assyrians, and they're no longer a problem. This is why there's peace and there's prosperity in the land of Israel. Because the Assyrians, not the Israelites, but the Assyrians had beat up Assyria had beat up Syria so much that they could not be the enemy that they used to be to Israel. But Jonah realizes that the bigger enemy is clearly the Assyrian Empire. The bigger enemy is in Nineveh. If the Lord came today and told you, Brett, go speak against the Koch brothers. Go speak against the powers that be. Go speak against that great enemy. And it, when I was growing up, that was Russia or the Soviet Union. Go speak against China. Go speak against Afghanistan. Go speak against those who have the power to defeat you and crush you. The fact of the matter is, 100 years later, that's exactly what would happen. So maybe he's just fearful of going into enemy territory. Maybe he's fearful of speaking to his enemy. Think about the enemies in your own life. What are you afraid to speak to? Are you afraid to speak to the enemy that is close by, that you know so well, that, that little addiction that bothers you? Are you willing to speak against the greater enemy, the enemy that wars against your soul? Is that too frightening for you to go speak, thus saith the Lord, unto your soul? Unto your enemy that it comes in, or the enemy that is just waiting, but you know that it's there. At any time, it can come in and rush in. We don't know exactly what he's afraid of, because in this book of Jonah, they don't get to it until the end. So like a good movie, we're not going to find out until the end what it is that he's truly afraid of. But we have to, in our own minds, come to grips with what we're afraid of. Is he afraid his image is going to be blown? Here he is, the high prophet, who has brought prosperity and spoke prosperity to the land. Is he afraid that he's going to become unpopular? Is he afraid of what it is that people are going to talk to him about and say about him? Is he afraid that... This is going to cost him too much. This is like uncomfortable, Lord. This is really inconvenient, God. I've got my stuff going on really well here. You want to take me out of the palace and take me across a dusty desert to go speak to my enemy. I don't think I'm ready for that today. In any which way, he chooses to refuse what it is that God wants him to do. And as a matter of fact, he decides to flee from God. Well... One, one, you know, nowadays we're much more educated, much more savvy to know we can't get away from God, right? We can try, but we can't escape the God who sees and knows and is everywhere. But in this time, in this state, there's a theology that God exists and resides in the temple. And that God is, 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 is located in, a, in an area. So what it is that Jonah decides to do is get out of that area. He decides to bail instead of stand. He decides to flee instead of fight. I'm sure some of you can understand that. I'm sure some of, some of you have done exactly that. The story goes on to tell us that Jonah chooses to buy a ticket to go to Tarshish. 
Now, that's the next scene we see after he leaves the palace. We see the prophet at the window buying a ticket to get passage on a ship to Tarshish. He seems a little pleased. He seems a little unconfident. He's not quite sure. But he's got the ticket in hand because he has the means. He's got the money to pay for it because he's a person who is part of the establishment. He's not lacking funds. He's not lacking direction. Or is he? Certainly he's lacking direction because he's going to Joppa to go to Tarshish. If you know the geography of the ancient Mediterranean world, on the very, very, very east end of the Mediterranean, you will find Israel. On the far, far, far western end, you will find Spain. Tarshish is in Spain. He's not only trying to flee God, like, I don't want to hear you, nah, 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 nah. He's running for his life. He is getting as far away from God as he possibly can. He's not going to Greece. He's not going to Rome. He's going all the way to the ends of the known world in that time. Not only that, but as he jumps on the ship, he's not sailing with his Hebrew brothers, his Israelite brothers. He is on the ship with a Phoenician crew because those are the people who mastered the seas at that time. So he not only is running from God, but he's running with God with a crowd who is not even thinking about God. Can you relate to that? Do you know somebody who gets a word from the Lord and it's pressing down upon them and they just go the opposite direction? God is here and they're just backpedaling until they can get to their running mode. That's what the prophet's doing. Doesn't the prophet know God? Shouldn't he know better? Of course he should. The scene we catch him next in is he's sleeping in the, in the ship. And he's got his passage and he's going. He's on his way fleeing from God. And all of a sudden a storm comes up. The storm, the winds, the waves, the rain is battering this ship. Everybody is up on deck trying to throw things overboard because sometimes when we don't know what to do, we panic. and We just do anything we can do in the natural to try to make things better. Maybe if I just get rid of these clothes or maybe if I just stop listening to this music or maybe if I do something, God will relent. Not so because God still has a mission for us. He still has his purpose to uh, continue in us. So as the Phoenician sailors call upon their gods and they throw things overboard, the storm does not subside. The captain goes down and finds Jonah resting in the ships uh, underneath in the cabins. They wake him up, say, call upon your God, call upon your God. We're in a storm and we are fighting for our life. Jonah knows what's going on. Jonah is not ignorant of the fact that this may be God coming after him. So they cry out to their gods, and they cast lots, because people who don't know the Lord, sometimes they got to find their own way of figuring things out, right? Casting lots, divination, Chloe, the, 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 the I can't, I don't even know what you call those folks you call up on the phone nowadays, but to get a word from a tarot reader, or to get a word from somebody who will tell you a fortune, you know what? Be careful what you deal with. Be careful because you know what? Sometimes that stuff might seem pretty true. They cast lots and the, last, the lot falls on Jonah. They're like, what's going on with you? What have you done? And he confesses to them, I'm running for my God. Now these people would have heard of the God of Israel, the God who brought the people out of Egypt, who brought them across the Jordan, who had them to destroy their enemies in the land of Canaan, a God who is more than able to deal with a situation. When have you been in a situation where all of a sudden you thought you had it all wrapped up? You were running with this crew. They didn't know you real well. But it was all, it was go, it was all going good. It was all going smooth until it wasn't. And all of a sudden, you're busted. 
your hands in the cookie jar. You got crumbs on your shirt. You're busted. What do you do? What should Jonah do? Should Jonah crawl back in the, in the midst of the ship and cower? Should he call upon his God? Well, thank God, Jonah decides to accept his responsibility. He says, this is because of me. I'm running from the Lord. He has something for me to do, and I'm not willing to do it. And this has come upon you because this has come upon me. Don't you know in the midst of your reluctance, when the Lord tells you to do something, it doesn't just affect you. It's going to affect your family. It's going to affect your friends. It's going to affect your community. When you're not in position, you're causing somebody else to be out of position. When you're not on your post, all of a sudden, there's a gap on the wall that the enemy can come in. Your family's not protected. When you're out of position and when you're not doing what the Lord has for you to do, cause other people to suffer as well as yourself. The story goes on, and they, Jonah says, cast me overboard. I don't want you to die with me. And I wondered about his decision. Sure, he doesn't want to be bl to blame for his friends or his new friends' downfall. But cast me in the ocean and get, get this done with. Is he giving up? Maybe he took responsibility, but maybe he said, I'm out. Take me, God. Just drown me. I can't take it anymore. I don't want these people to perish, but take me. I'm done. I give up. Well, they throw him overboard, and in the midst of this violent storm, you would think he would drown. Maybe that's what he wanted. Maybe he just wanted to get away from the calling, get away from what it is he had to do. But if you know the story, God prepared a fish. I'm not quite sure. You know, when I prepare a fish, you know, I do something very different with that fish. My wife is smiling. She knows what I do when I prepare a fish. I prepare it to be delicious, right? Because that's kind of how God has made me. But he prepares a fish differently for Jonah because he doesn't want Jonah to die. Jonah still has something to do. Fish comes and swallows up Jonah. I think I would rather drown. I think I would rather just be out of the situation. Not so with God. God has prepared a fish in which Jonah will stay for three days in the belly of the whale. What belly of what whale have you sat in? What dark and dank and suffocating place have you allowed yourself to be brought into? Where is it that you have given up so much so that God has to prepare something for you because you won't prepare it for yourself? Now, mind you, God did not intend for him to be chewed up, spit out, etc., etc. The whale swallows him whole, and he allows Jonah to sit in the midst of a very difficult and a dark place. What do we do in our dark place? What do we do in the midst of suffocating presence of, that, of something that we just don't even know what to deal with? Do you cry out? Do you roll over and die? Jonah cries out. It's interesting that it takes him a day or two to figure this out. Sometimes we can be pretty darn stubborn in our reluctance. But Jonah finally repents, he prays, he declares God's goodness, and God has the fish vomit him out onto the shore. God delivers Jonah from the dark place which he allowed him to go to because Jonah still had something to do, but Jonah needed to learn. The whale is the discipline. God may not force hard and difficult things upon you in your life, 
But because of our own choices, he may have to prepare a fish. He may have to prepare a very bad relationship. He may have to prepare some very uncomfortable finances for you. He may have to prepare you in a way for you to, 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 to deal with some hurts and some pains that you would rather not deal with. But remember what the Word of God says in Hebrews, the 11th verse. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. I can't imagine the belly of a whale is very pleasant. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Trained by it. Trained by it. There was something there that was supposed to be learned. There was something there that had to be grasped in order for him to continue on. I found it interesting in the Greek, the word for trained means to train as if you're preparing for a race. So you, you, you're doing all the things, the practice and all that that you need to do. But it comes from a greater root word, which means naked. How often do you have to be stripped down in the presence of God for him to get what you need to get? He rips off your ego. He tears down your pride. He casts away the things that you want and the things that you lean upon. The alcohol and the cigarettes, the clubs and the, 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 the TV. The things that keep you from being the person you're supposed to be. Keeps you from doing the things that you are to do. To be stripped down naked is to be taken down to your essence. At that point in God, you can't be anything but who God has created you. Naked you come into this world, naked you're going to go out. There's nothing you brought with you and there's nothing you can take with you. God will strip you down to the bare nakedness to get you to understand what it is that he wants you to understand. Now, you may not have to be stripped naked. Some of us do because we're rockheads. I'm chief among them. And I kid you not. I say that and you can laugh, but I kid you not. I can be exceedingly patient and understanding and obedient at times. And there are times I don't even know myself. I don't know where this comes from. I could blame it on my dad. I could blame it on something else. The fact of the matter is, when I'm stripped down naked and it's just me and God, I may be cold and I may be shivering. I may be uncomfortable, hallelujah, but I know that I'm covered. I remember being in the midst of a horrible situation in my life and coming up on the altar and Mother Jones prayed for me. I don't think I remember to this day what she prayed for me. But when I came up, God just put me down and broke me down as if I was clinging just to a rock and being battered by the, this horrible seashore and the, the ocean is just beating me up. And I held on to this rock, which is the Lord, which is his word. And while she's praying for me, and I don't know what she's praying for me, understand me, God has got me, God is stripping me down naked. So I'm not sure what she's praying and in the midst of it, I'm getting a vision that this black rock that I'm clinging to starts rising out of the ocean. And I climb on top of it, and it takes me out of my storm. And while I am naked, I am out of the storm. And while I am naked, I can start seeing my surroundings for what they are. While I'm naked, I am assured that God is with me, and he's protecting me, and he is providing for me. Jonah is spit up onto the the beach, and he has a job to do. Go to that great city of Nineveh and speak against it, for its wickedness has come up before me. So he travels to Nineveh. He travels through enemy territory. He gets to Nineveh. He looks over the land, takes a deep breath, and enters into Nineveh, that great city. It takes him three days to get the word out that, that in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. It's a rough word to give to people, but yet he was obedient in it. Nineveh, remember as I told you, 
Nineveh may represent this world, the unsaved world, this corrupt world that we live in. We have to speak to it. What happens in Nineveh is no, nothing short of a miracle. 120,000 people who are doing evil. And as we'll find out in 100 years' time, that repentance was just a blip on the radar screen. They come out to be some of the most vile and in inhuman conquerors ever to face off against an opponent and to uh, cause havoc and death and destruction on this planet. But as Jonah comes, they hear the word of God. It's not about Jonah. Now, Jonah has made it about himself over and over again, but it's not about Jonah. They don't see that Jonah's looking kind of raggedy. He's kind of smelling a little funky. You know, they're not quite sure what he's gone through, but clearly he has gone through. So it's not because his hair is done right. It's not because he has nice shoes. It's not because he's wearing a suit. It's not because he shows up in a nice car. But the Ninevites hear the word of God. When it comes down to it, what I'm doing here matters very little. What matters is the word of God. What will you do with that word? The Ninevites hear it. And a king is, is, is convicted by the word. And he decrees throughout the land, everybody put on sackcloth and ashes, which is to say, repent. They even put sackcloth and ashes on their animals. People fasted. Nobody was to eat, not even the animals. Nineveh repented in a way that could not be foreseen. We Go to the next scene, and here is Jonah sitting on top of the hill just waiting for the destruction of Nineveh. Again, think of Jonah as ourselves or the church. The, w the wicked and evil world, yeah, I can't wait to see God come and crush it. They get what they deserve. How quickly do we forget about ourselves? How quickly does Jonah forget about himself and what he has gone through? How quickly has he forgotten that he is a God of a second chance? God sees the repentant hearts of the Ninevites, and he stays his hand of destroying them. What is Jonah's response? Now we go back to the first scene that we saw in the movie. Here is Jonah sitting in the sand. This is what he speaks to the Lord in chapter 4, verse 3. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And we have to ask ourselves, how can you be right back to that same place? How is it, after all that God has done for you, to deliver you from your place of darkness, that you still have this attitude? Well, if we read back, we understand Jonah's anger. Verse 1 of, of chapter 4 says, But to Jonah this seemed wrong. This is God's compassion upon the Ninevites. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He is mad at God for God being God. He is mad at God for being compassionate. This is a lesson to Israel that God has compassion and desires to have compassion on the entire world. This is a lesson to the church today that God does not just want for us to be blessed and us to be prosperous and for us to have a knowledge of him. He desires for the entire world to have a knowledge of him. He desires for the whole world to be prosperous. He desires that the hearts of all men and women be changed. Jonah's response is, kill me. Kill me now. When did this become about Jonah? When did this become about you? When did this thing that God, hallelujah, has for you, when did it become about you? When did we make it about ourselves? Maybe that's just part of being human, and certainly it is. But when did this thing, when did God's will in your life become about you and not about him? When did it become about what you want and what you expect instead of what you need? 
Lord, I would like you to do this thing. I'd like it now. I'd like it to be read. I'd like it to be four doors. I would like for it to have nice wheels. I'd like it to be an automatic. I'd like power windows and leather seats. All right. Hell, heck yeah. We want, we want seat warmers. I never had seat warmers until like a couple years ago, and now, now I'm hooked. I'm in trouble. But we, I do live in Wisconsin, for crying out loud. If any place to have seat warmers, Wisconsin. Okay, that's our material wants. Lord, make her tall. Make her dark. Make her beautiful. Lord, make them tall. Make them light. Make them handsome. Make them a man of God who can provide for us and provide for our family. I'd like him to be educated. I think, I think you should send me a wife when I'm 25, because that's what I, I'd like that. That'd be nice. I think I need that now, God. Matter of fact, I see one over there. Can you give me her? What do you want? Lord, I want to be a professor. I want to be a lawyer. Well, do you want to do your homework when you're in middle school? Do you want to do your homework when you're in high school? Do you really want to go through all those college applications? Do you want to do what it takes to get to the best of the universities? But Lord, now I'm in college. I thank you for getting me here. And I'm, I'm on my way. But this professor is crazy. He told us we had to buy 13 books. I can't do that. It's going to cost you something. What is it? When, when did it become about you? What do you need? You need to be loved. You need to know that there is a God who can keep you and protect you and provide for your every need who can keep you and protect and provide for every need of your family. These are the things we need. What kind of box have you made for God in your life? How does he fit into your very picture frame that you have created for him? Don't put God in a box. How dare we put God in a box? Is your box big enough to contain the Lord, to contain a God who has spoke this entire universe into existence? Do you have a box that will fit him? Do you have a box to fit God into very neatly and very quietly? A God who understanding is limitless, and yet we have such a finite understanding of life. Is your box big enough? Is your box big enough to allow him to love you because you have a repentant heart and forgive you? Make sure your box is big enough because that God will love somebody else who repents and somebody else who he forgives. Is your box big enough for your enemy to fit in with God in your box? Are you able to, to pray for those who spitefully use you? Are you able to turn the other cheek? Can you fathom a God whose ways are above your ways, whose thoughts are above your thoughts? Can you understand a God and place him in a box who sees all and knows all and is all, a God who is and was and is still to come? Is your box big enough for that? Can you comprehend a God who is yet mindful of you, a God who knows the number of hairs upon your head? Hallelujah. Is, does your box understand that he knows your needs before you even ask of them? That his provision is already stored up for you before the situation comes? Is your box big enough? What are you doing with your box? Why do you have this box? What purpose does this box serve for you in your life? Is it comfortable? Is it cozy? Is it something that makes you feel good? Does it look good? Is it just something you've always been used to? What are you doing with this box? I don't think this box has enough room for a God. 
hallelujah, who wants to blow your mind and deliver you out of the things that have kept you and to keep you down. At what time are you going to cry out from the belly of the whale? What time are you going to cry out? What is it going to take for you to cry out in your distress? How many hospital visits is it going to take? How many people in your family that pass on and don't know the Lord? How many things will it take? What is going to bring you to that place that you will recognize God and stand, hallelujah, in his spirit? Your box serves no purpose. Your box limits you. Your box is your prison. Your box, hallelujah, does you no good. Your box does nobody any good. We have to get out of this box. We need to destroy this box. Jonah had a box. Maybe an alabaster box, something very nice, something that he loved, something that he was used to, something that he appreciated and valued. What are you valuing more than God? Hallelujah. That's what you have to ask yourself today. Because that box, hallelujah, is not helping you. Hallelujah. The Word of God is clear and is plain in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord in all your ways. Acknowledge Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and he will direct your paths. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask my wife to come and sing here for a moment. And then I want you to meditate on what he is saying, because what she's going to sing is quite the opposite of what Jonah has been doing. What she is going to sing, hallelujah, is what we ought to be about. And upon her singing and upon her completing that, I'm going to come back before you. I'm going to ask you to come and Lay your stuff down here today. Throw out your box. Crush your box. Be done with your box. Your box is of no use to you. to see the invisible expect the impossible receive the invisible faith that can conquer in